It's my uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker. I think everybody knows uh, Ed McCarthy, and I think he's uh, uh, speaking about one of the most important topics, and that is our history. I think uh, uh, getting a sense of history makes it easier to withstand uh, hard times, and uh, when times are good, it, it prevents us from the sin of hubris. Uh, but most importantly, I think, uh, understanding the history department gives us a better sense of our purpose and our mission and why we're here and the shoulders of those that we've stood on, that we stand on today. So Ed is a professor of pathology and orthopedic surgery. Uh, Ed, a pleasure and welcome. Thank you, Ralph. In a lot of ways, I don't feel worthy to do this presentation because of my connections with Johns Hopkins pathology are less strong than, let's say, Ralph's, because I did not go to medical school at Hopkins, I did not train in pathology at Hopkins, and I've only really been on the full-time staff here for only 14 years, which may seem long to some, but it's nothing compared to what some other people have around here. But one thing I am aware of is that I believe we have the strongest and the best pathology department in the world. And in, <laughs> and in deference to the privilege of getting to work here, I felt it was my charge to learn for myself about the history of our department. And so in putting this together, I really i am delighted everybody's here, a lot of our, our laboratory people. I had, the, had in mind, though, to put this together mainly for the residents because I want you guys to know where you're from in this department. And when you leave our program to carry with you to have some knowledge of the tradition, because the tradition is around us all the time, and there are still people around that are part of that great history. Now, some of you out there know a lot more than I do about the history, and I would be delighted if you would interrupt with some other fact. So if Ralph or Mabel or Daryl, John have something that you can just add to what, what I talk about, just Pipe right up and we'll, we'll stick it in there. Now, I always like to start this talk, and I've given this talk once before. I guess it must have been a long time ago because a lot of people don't remember it, but maybe that's because it was not memorable. Anyway, I'd like to start with a quiz. So I'll ask a few people who this is. And um, uh, John Schmig, who is this guy? This is William Welch. Excellent. Who is this guy right here? <laughs> Dr. Who? No, that's not Dr. Yardley. That's Dr. Hutchins. And in case you're, it, this is not Zari Karanjawala. <laughs> Marty Berman, okay, good. Who is now, if you don't know who this guy is, you're in <laughs> deep trouble. Who is this gentleman? Who is that? Sharon Weiss? who is my predecessor, who's, Risa was in this department for many, many years. She still is around in a lot of ways, and she is my predecessor as a residency director. Who is this guy? Joe Eggleston, who directed Surgical Path here for many years. This is a hard one. Emil Novak. Emil Novak. Who said that? <laughs> ah. <laughs> Excellent. Who is this young lady right here? Mabel Smith. And here's <laughs> Mary Lakin. Who is this? Bill Shelley, Shelley Lecture. Now, these are some dates I think you should have in mind. These are sort of important dates in the history of Hopkins Hospital. Johns Hopkins died in 1873. 1876, Johns Hopkins University was formed. 1889, Johns Hopkins Hospital. 1893, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And to put this in perspective, let's look at a few other dates. As you see, Hopkins is a relatively recent comer to the education scene. Harvard was formed in 1636, the oldest university in the country. The first hospital in the country, founded by Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia, is the Pennsylvania Hospital, 1751. The first medical school in the country, University of Pennsylvania Medical School, just before, or even well before, the uh, Revolutionary War, 1765. And even the University of Maryland Medical School is almost 80 years older than we are, being founded in 1807. So Johns Hopkins Institution, the medical complex, et cetera, 
is relatively recent. Now, this is a photograph of Johns Hopkins. Now, first of all, let me get something clear. Why this extra name up in Johns Hopkins, just so you guys know? Well, around 1700, two prominent Quaker families united when Margaret Johns married Gerard Hopkins. And their first son, they named as a fusion, Johns Hopkins, from those two names. And this Johns Hopkins, our Johns Hopkins, is the grandson of the original Johns Hopkins. So that's how we got the extra S. So he was a prominent Quaker uh, a family in, the, in Maryland. He was a very wealthy industrialist. He never married. And when he died in 1873, he left $7 million to be split equally to the foundation of a university and of a medical center. The first president of the university, which was uh, founded earlier, uh, was, well, it was founded in 1876, um, was the first president of the university was Daniel Coit Gilman, who was a far-sighted man. And Gilman hired this man, John Shaw Billings, who was a prominent army surgeon, to create the vision of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And what he did was he planned out who he was going to invite. He planned the buildings. And I was curious, Ralph, this is not the same Billings that built the University of Chicago hospitals, another Billings. And so Billings went looking for who would be the first person to start the hospital. And he found from asking around that this man, William Welch, who was working at the time in Germany with some very prominent German pathologists, would be the keystone to form Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, and that was in 1876 when Welch in Germany was approached by Billings. And indeed, he was persuaded to come to Baltimore um, to do uh, the foundation of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And this is a painting of the very first sort of meeting with Daniel Coit Gilman, Billings, and Wells, together with some trustees of the university, making the initial deal, yes, you're going to come to Johns Hopkins, and you're going to make us a hospital and a medical school center. And here's a photograph of, of Gilman, Billings, and Welch together uh, at those initial days of the foundation of Johns Hopkins. Now, jump ahead to 1930, and here's a photograph of William Welsh on his 80th birthday. He looks pretty good for 80. And I should tell you that he celebrated his 80th birthday with a radio program where he sat next to the President of the United States, Hubert, I can never say this, Herbert Hoover, who was at his birthday, and he at the time was the father of American medicine. He was the dean of all medicine in the United States, the most famous physician in the country. And that's kind of cool to think that a pathologist was that. So this is him on his 80th birthday. Notice this picture right here is a photograph of his friend, William Osler. And I'm going to, this is a picture that's on his wall that actually this photograph is on the wall in the pathology fourth floor. And I'll show it to you a little bit closer later. Welch is only one of two pathologists to ever make the cover of Time magazine. And this is April 1930. Can anybody name the other guy? Ewing. James Ewing. And this is a year later. The, the cancer man, James Ewing, also made the Time. We're waiting for Brooks to get on there. <laughs> so this is a little bit about William Welch. 1850 to 1933, he went to Yale to college. He had gone to Columbia Medical School. He went to Europe. And he, and why he attracted Billings' attention was that he set up in Bellevue Hospital in New York the very first laboratory, pathology laboratory, in, the, in, the, in America. He was an innovator, and he believed that pathology should be based on science and that medicine should be based on pathology. He came to Baltimore in 1885. The hospital opened in 1889, medical school in 1893, and in 1917, Welch retired as pathology, of the, as pathology chairman to become the first dean of the School of Public Health. And just as an anecdote, Welch, 17, 1917 was the year when the great flu epidemic began, and Welch was invited to New Jersey to do postmortems on the very first deaths of the great flu epidemic. And somebody commented that in in Welch's entire life, that's the first time they had ever seen him visibly shaken when he was doing these autopsies on the first flu victims. This, in order to get Welch to come, 
this was the very first building in the hospital on the Hopkins campus before the hospital, and this is the original pathology building. Built in 1886, two floors, and believe it or not, this is where on the corner of Welch and Wolfen Monument, right there where the pathology building is today, and this is what they built for Welch, who had been working with his colleague over at what was called the Bayview Asylum. Still is an asylum, if you ask me. <laughs> no offense, Fred. With his colleague. <laughs> with his colleague, William Councilman. Have you heard of Councilman bodies? Well, Co Councilman and Welch were together, and they were together for a long time until Councilman went off to Harvard. But the two of them moved from the Bayview Asylum to this pathology building where they set up shop before the hospital was built. And by the way, the Bayview Hospital, for those of you who are interested, a good friend of mine recently wrote a history of that, but first it was called the Bayview Asylum, then it was called Baltimore City Hospital, then it was called the Francis Scott Key Hospital, and then it was called the Bayview Hospital, which it is today. So this is that building, the first pathology building, and this is the site of the Hopkins Hospital as they were building it. <laughs> and then here's the building in 1889, designed by John Shaw Billings, and this is what it looked like, and those not a whole lot different. This was the male ward, this was the female ward. This was uh, some other... Uh, administration maybe still. Now, they didn't have enough money to finish the hospital. They were worried about it. So a very wealthy family, the Garrett family, and Mary Elizabeth Garrett, a very wealthy philanthropic woman, decided to give $300,000 to the hospital so they could finish it. With a stipulation that women be admitted into the medical school from the, the get-go. And this was an amazing thing. As you may not know, Harvard Medical School did not allow women in until after World War II. So having women in medical school right off was quite a thing. So Mary Elizabeth Garrett gave that money with the stipulation. This is the same Garrett of Garrett County, um, and the Garrett family is still a very prominent family in Baltimore. It, it turns out that in that era, only 10% of, of physicians had gone to medical school. They were learning their trade on the street or in these proprietary medical schools. Now, this painting is by John Singer Sargent, who is a famous, um, a famous English portrait painter. And in addition to giving her $300,000, she also supported the commission of this portrait, which is also by John Singer Sargent, uh, a sergeant of the, quote, the four doctors. This is over in the Welch Library. I don't know if you've seen it there, but it's in the Welch Library. This was painted in London uh, in Sargent's studio. Again, it, it was painted in 1906. In, and this actually is in El Greco that, uh, that was owned by Sargent at the time that found its way into the, the painting. And there's very interesting. Hey, let's spell Pulse and Oster properly the next time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you very much. I, they let me into medical school before the standards <laughs> got there. This is Welch, this is Halstead, this is Osler, and this is Kelly. I got Kelly right. That's, that's. <laughs> well, the, the important thing about the foundation of Hopkins and why I think it's really cool to be in pathology at Hopkins is that pathology is, is essentially the cornerstone of medical care here at Hopkins that the whole Hopkins medicine was founded on pathology and that it, it, pathology being based on science, according to Welch's view, that medicine would be based on science. And that the laboratory, that little building initially, turned out to be, and I believe the attitude still is here, that the laboratory is the soul of Johns Hopkins medicine and that we as pathologists are the cornerstone of the healthcare team. That's the way we feel here at Hopkins and that is, that is a really I think a great thing about being pathologist here. The new concept is that Hopkins would be a teaching hospital. The Massachusetts General Hospital was around for a long time before uh, Hopkins and medical students were not allowed to go in there. But Hopkins would be a teaching hospital. And with day one of the hospital, 1889, they formed the Johns Hopkins Hospital Bulletin. This is a journal that was in press until the 50s or 60s, uh, and it was a venue of many important publications. And if you look at this here, there is the little uh, 15 cents it cost, you see. 
the, in, the instruction in pathology is under the charge of William Welch, professor of pathology up here. You can see instruction will be given at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in pathology, medicine, surgery. This is the initial concept. This is going to be a teaching hospital here at Johns Hopkins. And this is a photograph of the very first graduating class, 1897. They hadn't graduated yet, but they were together in this photograph. All, there's Welch and his students around him. They all went on to industrious careers in one field or another. The guy that particularly interested me that went on to an industrious clear, uh, career, I think it was in neurosurgery, was this guy right here. <laughs> he went into orthopedics. <laughs> but I wanted to call your attention to this young man. Anybody know who that is? McCallum. This is William George McCallum who when he was in medical school made an important discovery on the life cycle of malaria. And he would become the second chairman of pathology in Johns Hopkins and last as that chairman for almost 30 years. Well, in 1906, this was the pathology department. And by now, McCallum is a graduate from medical school and he's a pathologist working with Welch. You might notice this man here is George Whipple of Whipple's disease. And Whipple was in the department for many years and then took off to go to California to work and left the department. Now, this is 1907. McCallum left around 1908 to go be professor of pathology at the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia in New York. This is a picture of him in that location. And there he wrote his famous, famous textbook, the textbook of pathology, William George McCallum. And this became the standard pathology text for at least 30, 40 years. It went in many, many editions. This is a photograph in the rare book room over here at Hopkins. 1916 was this published. And you can see that all the illustrations were drawings, like this picture of Ricketts or this, what was called arthritis to four mans, which is just osteoarthritis. And so that's a remarkable book. And it's a collector's item today, especially if you have a first edition of this. My dad actually uh, in, in, went into dental school in 1940, and he had um, uh, one of these McCallum textbooks of pathology. So here's McCallum at the chair of pathology, 1917. This is the year that Welch left. McCallum took over as chairman of the department, and he stayed as chairman until 1944. McCallum was, was a researcher. Um, he was a founder if you will, of pathophysiology. He looked what happened when you did pancreatic duct ligation. He studied the effects of hyperparathyroidism. He described, you've heard of McCallum's patch in the heart. He demonstrated that the lymphatic system was a closed system of vessels. He was a great teacher, and here he is in the autopsy room teaching uh, residents probably uh, the uh, something about some organ or another. <laughs> but he would never married. And here, after many, many years, he looks a little bit sad. His quote was, I think Jack Yardley told me this, he was known to have said, a pathologist is either a, a successful one, is either single or unhappily married. <laughs> However, I like to throw this one in, and it was, it was Yardley that told me this also, is that he had this fascination for years and the some relationship or another with this famous movie actress. Anybody know who this is? This is Gloria Swanson. And somehow, I, th I think that will remain a mystery. Gloria Swanson had seven husbands herself and twice as many boyfriends. But somehow or another, McCallum was involved with her. Now, here's the building <laughs> that McCallum built. He added many floors to that two-floor building. By now, it's connected to the hospital. Here's the inside of one of those laboratory rooms. Notice that the microscopes, this is what you would have, you, if you were guys who were residents, this is what you'd be looking at. They were put by the window because you had to have sunlight to come in and shine on the mirror, which gave you the light. Here's the autopsy room. This is a dictaphone, by the way. <laughs> this is a skylight, and the light would come down and light the room up. And I'll show you a bunch of photographs, which were taken right here, of various pathology classes. Now, when you go out of the building today, this is what you're going to see when you go across the street to the main hospital. And this is the original <coughs> pathology building. Uh, with floors added. This is the two tower, the two things here. The autopsy, uh, the bodies would be picked up right here. And here is the same building now uh, in about 1920. And there is where the autopsy suite was and the buildings were dropped off right there. Notice those 
those uh, pillars are still there. This is where they would drop off bodies um, or pick them up for the autopsy suite. So this is the heart of our life here. And I, I must say, I was very glad when I heard that this building would not yet be knocked down for the new renovations because this is where I, where I believe the shades and the spirits are still walking around in our department. So 1921, I'd like to point out to you, uh, McCallum is, is yet to be, is going to be chairman for 20 more years, but this guy who is his uh, man in the department is Arnold Rich, the third chairman of the Department of Pathology. Arnold Rich had gone to, he was a genius, he had gone to medical school, here at Hopkins, but he had took, taken only two years to go through college at, in Virginia. Uh, he lived till 1968. Now, just as some figures to show you, in 1930, about this time, there were 24, but actually only 12 full-time staff. The budget of the department was $52,000, and there were two secretaries. Today, there are 118 full-time staff. The budget of the department is $80 million, and there are at least 42 secretaries. So you can, actually, in 1965, there were 65 staff. That's a pretty big department for 1965. So here's the department probably in about 1930-something. McCallum. Rich has now migrated to be the right-hand man of McCallum. And sitting on his right is this woman. Who is this? Ella Oppenheimer, who stayed in the department for many, many years, 38 years Ella Oppenheimer was in the department. And who was sort of the spirit, the soul of the department, a great figure. She was beloved by everybody, a very, very important player in the history of Hopkins pathology. Here she is uh, as she's older in her office. Her specialty was pediatric pathology, but she was a fabulous teacher of medical students. They adored her. And she also was the first to put together the whole concept of let's get a diagnostic I index for this department. So if we want to do a paper on some weird topic, we can go and we can find those. That's Ella Oppenheimer. Now, this is the pathology library, as it was in 1982, as you can see that photograph. It's kind of a neat place, if you ask me. And this library was de dedicated in 1984 to Ella Oppenheimer. And there is her portrait there. Now, Something has changed since then, because in 1989-90, this library was split in half. This half over here became the sign-out area in cytopathology. So when you're in cytopath and you're looking out the windows, you're looking at that view right over there. This area right here is now the corridor, and this is the door to the Meyer building, and this fireplace was swung around. So the library has made half its site. So go in there next time you're up on the fourth floor and look at this area. And when you're there, you can look at the portrait of Ella Oppenheimer, who, and that's still hanging there above the fireplace. So 1942, this is a picture of the department, and you can see Rich is still at McCallum's side. <laughs> they were together a long time. I've always been intrigued by this woman right there. Just the expression on her face is very, very – anybody know who that is? God, I'd love to find out. She, she is, doesn't look like she, she knows some secret that nobody else knows. So now, McCallum is just about to step down, and Rich is the only one in this department. We can see now he's the centerpiece of this department. Now, Rich was a very interesting man. He was uh, originally Jewish and converted to Christianity because to make your way up the Hopkins ladder was almost impossible if you were Jewish. So he converted, and he indeed make his way up the, the ladder. And that was fairly true in those era. In the 40s, it was very difficult to, to be Jewish and to be at Hopkins. So Sinai Hospital was built right across the street where we, well, where the Turner Auditorium is and where the Ross Building is. That was Sinai Hospital in those days. And the pathology department was run by a man named Toby Weinberg. And Toby Weinberg was one of Bhagavan's teachers. And then in 1950, and it was built there because uh, Jewish physicians could get training there. Jewish patients would go there. There was no discrimination there, obviously. And in 1959, Sinai Hospital moved up to where it is uh, today up in North Baltimore. But Rich was a funny guy. 
He was a very good researcher. He described serum sickness. He, just, he worked on the pathophysiology of jaundice. He studied TB, and he also studied interstitial lung disease. Here is a picture of Rich and Dr. Hammond of the Department of Internal Medicine. Here, here's, two peop here's Rich again working at, at something. And here is <laughs> there's a famous paper that Hammond and Rich note. You guys may not know of Hammond-Rich syndrome. Do you guys, your residents, ever hear of it? We call it usual interstitial pneumonia. No. Isn't that right, Fred? No, it's, it's, it's DAD. Diffuse aldehyde damage, or whatever. I, I don't understand. <laughs> but at any rate, they wrote that. I knew, I knew it was more complicated than I could. Clinicians have had that screwed up for years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They never read it safe. Well, this was in this famous paper, which was in the Bulletin of Johns Hopkins Medicine, which is still working in 1944. Now, a couple interesting things about Rich. He hated cytopathology. He hated external funding, although he was a great teacher. He was kind of a very reactive person. I mean, he didn't want to go forward in a lot of ways. And then about in the 30s, you know, is when, when the board exams for almost all specialties were formed. Board exams, American Board of Pathology, Board of American Thir uh, Orthopedic Surgery, all in the 1930s. And when the board came to look at Hopkins Hospital, to judge it worthy, Rich would refuse to let them in. And his comment was, who is going to evaluate me? <laughs> so what happened was, according to John, um, told me this, is that the residents and staff secretly met with the, invest with the, uh, the evaluators outside the, the hospital so they, wouldn't, they knew they would get in trouble if they didn't submit to that eventually. Well, I love to show this picture, too, because this is Dr. John Frost. And, you know, the cytopathology people there, uh, you know, Chong, Chris, this was the soul of cytopathology for 30 years. He stabbed the cytopathology at Johns Hopkins, and Rich hated him. Rich would not <laughs> let him be in the department. He had to find another department to go get an office in. And only when Rich retired could Frost then um, become uh, part of the pathology department. Now, uh, Rich w was also, you know, a very interesting guy in a lot of ways because he, um, he was a very outstanding violist, and his wife was a, was, a, was a very good pianist. So when he would have journal club over at his house, which was required for the residents, he would make everybody sit and listen to him play the viola. <laughs> you know, I have to say, I've never done that to you with a cello. <laughs> so this is his daughter. Anybody know who this is? Adrian. This is Adrian Rich, who is a very famous poet. Um, she wrote about her father in a lot of ways. And of course, she's, uh, this is one of her books of being woman born. Uh, and I think she's still alive, actually. Adrian Rich is still alive. 1955, 1956. Rich is chairman of the department. And who makes his appearance in this photograph but this guy right here? <laughs> Anybody know who that is? I don't know if Jack is here. This is Dr. Jack or Dr. John Yardley. 50 years he's been in this department. Here he is. He's a young man. But Rich retires, and Ivan Bennett becomes the chairman of pathology and begins a renaissance here in the department. Now, the problem with Ivan Bennett, as some people saw it, is that he was not a pathologist. <laughs> Ivan Bennett was an infectious disease expert in the Department of Internal Medicine. And a lot of people, by the way, I, in my understanding, there are departments here and there in the country that are chaired not by pathologists but by other specialists because of supreme administrative skills or a genius in getting grants or whatever. Bennett was not a pathologist, and that enraged some people. And uh, Ralph told me this one, is that one of the faculty person at the time got so enraged when he heard that a non-pathologist was going to be chairman, that he took all the special stains <laughs> and threw them all over the wall. And they looked like a Jackson Pollock painting, like this, or like that one over against that wall right there. And it stayed up on that wall for many, many years. So such that when, when Arnold Rich would come through as a retired person, and he would look, and he said, look, that the painting's in honor of me. <laughs> But you can see the, um, you can see the um, renaissance that, that uh, Bennett did. I mean, he redesigned the department. He redesigned the buildings. He redesigned the autopsy room. He did everything different. 
in the pathology department, including getting its size big. And at this point, this guy makes his appearance in the department. Anybody know who that, do you know who that is, John? <laughs> That's Dr. John Boynton. So here is uh, Ivan Bennett. He did actually know fairly, a, fair, a fair bit about pathology. And here we have this picture of this young man right here. This is not John Cuda here. <laughs> and here is Grover Hutchins again. Well, here's the, one of the groups of secretaries, and I'd like to, to show you this picture here, as we now know as Mabel. This is Mary Lakin. Here's a great photo of Mabel at her desk, being efficient as usual. <laughs> Mabel, you've been under six department chairmen, is that correct? Six department, of the nine department chairmen, Mabel has been at her desk working away for her. Now, because Ivan Bennett was not a pathologist, he did hire this man, and you should know this person. This is Walter Sheldon, who was a supreme pathologist, and he sort of took over the running of the pathology aspects of the department when Bennett was uh, the chairman. Now, at that time, and I threw this slide in just recently, the laboratories of the hospital were sort of thrown everywhere. They were in medicine, they were in pathology and OB, but in 1968 is when they all came together in one organization called the Department of Laboratory Medicine. Some people would call it clinical pathology. And it was headed up by a man named Rex Kahn. So it was in 1968 that laboratory medicine took its shape here at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And for you guys who now rotate between AP and CP, laboratory medicine, until San Filippo got here, was a totally different residency. In 1966 or so, Bennett was invited to go to Washington to work under the Johnson administration as deputy director of science. And he left one of his brilliant young men in the department to be acting chairman. And it was this guy right here, Robert Heptonstall, who was a renal pathologist, come from England. It's Heppy's not here now, right? Came from England to work in our department, but it was also a, a, a great administrator. Here, he must be dissecting out a, a glomerulus. Wouldn't you think so, Lorraine? Probably. So Heppy became, then Bennett never came back after his stint in Washington because he went on to be the dean at NYU. So Heppy took over in 1969 and he was chairman until 1988, which is 19 years, so still a long time. And Heppy was a renal pathologist, and here is his group at the time of, re now this year, I would imagine it's about 1974, because this is about the year I made the scene in Baltimore when I came to sign a hospital. This is Heppy, the chairman. This is one of his residents, Sharon Weiss. This is Risa Mann, who was in our department for many years. This is Jim Egan, who runs pathology at the St. Joseph Hospital. Stan Hamilton is over here. Oh, Stan Hamilton is there? Unbelievable, yeah. <laughs> Sina Eisner, she's up in New Jersey now. All those guys, it's, it's fabulous to see them. Here's a little closer up of those. Now here's the staff at the time. Now you can see jo John Frost is perfectly accepted in the department by now. <laughs> this is uh, Rock, who was the chairman of the laboratory of medicine at that time. Heppy, Jack Yardley, John Boytnot, and Joe Eggleston, who uh, for at this point was sole chairman of pathology, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Of surgical path. Now, Heppy was a renal pathologist and is responsible for writing the, at the time, which was the book on renal pathology because Dr. Heptonstall's contribution was to look at renal changes in terms of the renal biopsy. So renal biopsy and that concept of looking at changes was all Heppy's, and this is his famous book of 1966. This is, this is the second edition, but this is the first edition was 1966. And this has gone through many editions, and the last time I saw Heppy, he was still working on some new edition of this book. Now, Heppy retired in 1988, and the chairmanship was taken over by these two guys, Jack Yardley, and John Boytnot, right over here. And they were chairman as jointly for four years. John headed up the, uh, Dr. Boytnot headed up the hospital side, and Jack headed up the university side. And when you talk to Jack, I asked him how long he was chairman. He said, as long as the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> and in 
And I don't know whether he meant he was the North and you were the South, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, was a good, it was a good couple of years in the department and you guys held it together. And, um, and here we are back to the four doctors by Sargent. And the reason I'm showing this now is gonna move on. Because all these guys were very, very versed in pathology. William Osler had done hundreds of autopsies, and he even wrote about his autopsies. Halstead spent many years in that little laboratory uh, of pathology that Welsh had built. And his protégés became the original surgical pathologist, and this is he. This is the original surgical pathologist at Johns Hopkins Hospital. You should know. Now, Daryl Carter in the back has written extensively on surgical pathology at Johns Hopkins. So, Daryl, say anything you need to or would like to. But uh, John's, uh, this is a picture of Joe Bloodgood, and he was a surgeon, and he did surgical pathology. Because in those days, surgical pathology was invented by surgeons. Arthur Purdy Stout, for example, was a surgeon originally. So the surgeons did surgical pathology, and Bloodgood was a major figure, major player in this department. And he operated in a time where it, there wasn't anything as a specialty. You were a surgeon, and you got an interest in this or that, but you could do any surgery you wanted to do. And, and Bloodgood did breast surgery, and he did bone surgery. So he, cons he sort of developed the concept of the frozen section. Now, I'm not clear on this, but Hopkins seems to claim to have done the first frozen. Well, Bloodgood, as surgeon, was, did a lot of important work in surgical pathology. For example, he described what it was, the pathology of fibrocystic change of the, breath, of the breast. And in this one, differential diagnosis of the disease of the female breast. Here's another one, biopsy. And by the way, a lot of people did not believe, a lot of surgeons didn't believe in the quote, the biopsy. Ewing's, Ewing did not believe in biopsies. He thought that was a bad idea. But Bloodgood said, we got to biopsy these people before we do the Halstead mastectomy on them, for example. So he wrote about the, the biopsy and breast lesions. He also wrote a lot about giant cell tumors of bone. This is a painting done, if you will, by Harvey Cushing of one of Bloodgood's patients. You can say, uh, you see, this is a Halstead case. And Bloodgood was a, did a very famous uh, article, uh, did a whole lot of collecting of bone tumors. And as what happens sometimes in medicine, all blood goods cases were stolen and published by these two guys, Geschichter and Copeland, who were in New York at the time in Washington, or they were in Washington at the time. And so when you read this book, these are all Hopkins-based uh, patients. Here's, a, here's Rich. This is 1958. This is before Bennett. But look, there's a guy here I want you to see. This is William Shelley. Here's a closer picture of him. And Shelley led surgical pathology for, nine, for 10 years, 1960 to 1970. Here he is. He had his unfortunate sad death in 1974 in an airplane crash. His son died the next week in an automobile accident. So you should know that our Shelley lecture is dedicated to both him and his son. And so the Shelley Lecture has begun in 1979 in honor of Bill Shelley. Joe Eggleston shared with Daryl Carter in the back co-directorship of surgical pathology in the 60s and 70s. Daryl, is that about right? Um, till 77. 77. Then Daryl went off to Yale and left Joe as chief of surgical path by himself at Johns Hopkins. He, Joe Eggleston trained Epstein. He trained, um, uh, you were gone, he was gone by the time you got up, Ralph. I was a resident. Though. You were a resident under Eggleston, yeah. <laughs> and he and Daryl Carter, uh, Carter, the two foremost experts on lung cancer at the time, um, and wrote the fascicle at that time. And paradoxically, Joe Eggleston got lung cancer. A smoker, he was. But he survived a long time, years. And I myself personal, have per personal recollections of sitting in the sophomore lecture hall, listening to Joe Eggleston lecture to the medical students on lung cancer, knowing that he had lung cancer while he was doing it. So that kind of moved me a little bit. Of course, in my crazy days, and I'd run outside between the lectures and the lab and have a cigarette. <laughs> but fortunately, so did he. <laughs> fortunately, we put that down. Now we go back to this great picture, and we're going to call our attention for a few minutes on Howard Kelly. 
right here, who was a GYN surgeon, the first gynecologist at the hospital, and this is a photograph of Kelly, um, a dynamic man, and his protege is Thomas Cullen. Now, Cullen, when he came on, Kelly didn't have a spot for him in the surgery area, so he put Cullen in the lab with Welch. And Cullen started to do research on GYN pathology and saw so many cases of GYN disease that he wrote a book. And this is the operating room where Kelly and Cullen did all their work. They're all, this is the GYN operating room. And Cullen was able to publish this book in 1909, Cancer of the Uterus. So I have to be careful because once my tr secretary transcribed that sentence as cancer of the universe, but <laughs> I figured it's close. And he dedicated this book to Howard Kelly and, his, and William Welch, his teachers. Here is what the frozen section machine looked like at the time, and Cullen and Kelly did frozen sections. Here's a photograph from that book, or actually it's not a photograph, it's a drawing. Here's another drawing of secretory endometrium in that book. I hope that's secretory endometrium. I haven't looked at an endometrium in 20 years. But GYN pathology then took off with this man, Emil Novak. In 1915, he was a gynecologist, and he was interested in pathology, and he put all this together to write this classic textbook of GYN pathology. In 1940, Emil Novak, now keep in mind, Emil Novak was a gynecologist, not a pathologist. And this is his successor, Donald Woodruff, who was also a gynecologist, not a pathologist, and wrote this book, which is Novak's Obstetric Gynecologic Pathology. Novak, I guess this was Emil's son, and this is Don Woodruff, who was that picture I showed you. This is the book I learned pathology of the GYN pathology from, this very book. And you should know that for many, many years, all through Woodruff, that GYN pathology belonged to gynecology department. Is that correct, Mabel? It was not under pathology, it belonged to GYN. It was, located in it was located here, but it was run by GYN pathology. Then this chairman, Dr. Fred Sanfilippo, came in 1993 when Yardley and Boytnot had had enough. <laughs> and they got Fred Sanfilippo, who came from Duke and created another renaissance among which was to reunite anatomic and clinical pathology and integrate them completely. So you guys are benefiting from that work right now. Well, one of the things Fred did, I mean, he really increased the size of the department, and he brought with him an incredible group of people that have really enriched our, our department, like Mike Borowitz or Peter Berger or Wink Baldwin. All the, as a matter of fact, Hopkins was known as Duke North because of San Filippo coming with all his people uh, to the department. And you can see 1999, what a, what a big department this is at that particular time. So in summary, here are our de department chairman, right up to the present, and we are very fortunate to have Brooks Jackson now as our chairman, who is going to obviously be in the same mold as all those other uh, already is in, in our department. We are very happy to be here. and. With our history, we are really know that uh, we've come from a lot of places. So I have to show you this one, and I have to show you the objectives that in the department. And I want to thank these people, all of whom I interviewed, John Boynett, Yardley, Heptonstall, Mabel, Grover, Gert Brigger, his history of medicine, and Ralph. Thank you very much.